football jersey. Its importance is visible at the annual kit releases and on the supporters' faces. Then the discussions about color and pattern begin. Too much black or too much yellow? If we look closely, we'll find the club's logo on the right side. The neck might feature the team's slogan. The back is of course reserved for the players' names. Looking good! When big players are put into it, the value of the fabric increases. Millions watch, live in the stadium or online. And with each new superstar at the club, the garment finds more buyers. I'm very lucky. I'm, I got the first one. <laughs> it's a great emotion for you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, too exciting. If you didn't already know, choosing a jersey can cause headaches. Let's say if I wanted to get a Manchester City shirt. The home shirt, away shirt, third kit, the keeper's kit, anniversary kit. When we think about it, it says a lot about us. Football kits are much more than just sportswear. They mirror the times we live in. This is no coincidence. Simplified designs in the 60s. At the turn of the century, they were much more eccentric. And today, every rapper has a Manchester United or Liverpool jersey or both hanging in their closet. But why? Kits are workwear, like doctor scrubs or firefighter suits. Footballers wear them while they work. But they are different from stuff like this and this, among other things because of you. Football shirts are much more than pragmatic workwear items. They have multiple functions. This explains why players wore camouflage, tuxedo pattern, tiger stripes, country style, muscle shirts, or this. And why Hamburg gave Barcelona a good laugh. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Because to understand why kids reflect the spirit of the time, we first have to understand where they come from. In the middle of the 19th century, when football became more popular, there were no uniforms. Players would turn out in whatever they had to hand and teams would be distinguished by wearing colored caps or scarves. The first reference to colors came from here, Sheffield FC, the oldest football club in the world, stated in 1857, each player must provide himself with a red and dark blue flannel cap, one color to be worn each side. Clever! Slowly the first kits began to appear, when shirts were dyed in the colors of the sports club and had the club's logo sewn on. An original style and a long-lasting one. For almost a century, kit fashion didn't really change. Except one detail. Numbers. Very helpful for the spectators. Now they were able to tell the players apart. This was the first FA Cup final ever when shirt numbers were worn. After that, they became popular in England. 22 years after they first had in Australia. Sydney Leichhardt's match against HMS Powerful was set to be the first game with numbers on kits. It's difficult to prove as photographers miss the chance to capture this historic football moment. Obviously not in Argentina, where this picture was taken, when numbered shirts were used for the first time ever in South America. The materials used to make early kits were cotton and wool, and that remained until the 1960s when players like Bobby Charlton, Ferenc Puskas, Eusebio, Uwe Seeler and Lev Yashin dominated football. And all wore a very similar kind of plain jersey. Hang on. How did we recognize these stars back then? Easy. Their names were written on the back of the kit. <laughs> Just kidding. They might have been the Ronaldos of the 60s, but their kits did not reflect any stardom. Of course they didn't, because they held down regular jobs too, like German 60s superstar Uwe Seeler. These were normal people, shaped by the post-war years. They embodied what most of the supporters in the stadiums longed for. Integrity, respect and a sense of belonging together. This was reflected in the plain and unassuming kit designs and they looked better under floodlights, which became much more widely used around this time. Simplification was the norm in everything, from furniture to football in this era. And nobody could imagine why anything should change. 
but it did. Historians describe the 70s as a pivot of change. Student protests, feminist and anti-war movements. This, and also the development of color TV affected football and of course, football kids. These possible designs from a German sports show displayed football's new wild side. 1974 world champion Günther Netzer liked it. Ja, ich bin im Grunde genommen auch der Meinung, dass mehr Farbe in die Stadien rein soll. Das ist ein Service auch an die Zuschauer. And the audience got to see more. Look at Kevin Keegan, who grew up in Scunthorpe wearing this inconspicuous combo. When the England star went to Hamburg in 1977, he found himself wearing this jersey. Hamburg boss Peter Kohn wanted his players to stand out. Pink had been used as a color for football kids before. Italian side Palermo wore it with black ties in 1907. But for Keegan and his teammates in the 1970s, it must have felt as if they were put on the pitch in tutus. In color psychology, this color is associated with loveliness, tenderness and gentleness. Not really useful traits in sports. You can't put the team in kits like this if you're bottom of the table, said Korn, and he knew what he was doing. The Barca players weren't smiling for long after they were beaten 6-0 by the players in pink. <laughs> Several clubs introduced unusual variations of their traditional colors. But colors were not the only thing clubs experimented with. See the writing on the front? That changed a lot too. This is probably the most famous deer in the world. When Jägermeister offered Eintracht Braunschweig half a million German marks, it marked the beginning of kit sponsorships. The days when football kits only represented a club's hometown were over. Commerce was now a key part of the design. The English lower league team Kettering Town was harshly criticized for displaying a local firm's branding in 1976. But that was nothing compared to when Liverpool became the first British top flight club that said yes to kids' sponsorship. Many Reds were not amused by having this Japanese company's name on their kits in 1979. Kit sponsorship was challenging for football in the beginning. The now defunct German team SV Beesweiler 09 had nuclear energy yes printed on their shirts. And they got 15,000 German marks out of the deal. But when the responsible association was asked if the German anti-nuclear movement could print their expression nuclear power, no thank you on kids, they said... The Frage kann ich eindeutig mit Nein beantworten, weil ich darin ein Politikum sehen würde. Less political but no less embarrassing for Joe Jordan was this AC Milan kit sponsor from 1981. Empty space on kits became rare, but one part was still unused. Let's check 1990, when all footballers wear no names. So the 1992 European Championship marked another important development in kit design. The players' names were printed on the back. The team was individualized, which fits well in a decade defined by personal computers, cell phones and solo fun sports. Hard marketing move as fans could now feel a little bit closer to their idols. In the 90s, shirts were an eye-catcher. Above all, the keeper style exploded. A bewildering range of novel color schemes came into vogue, like this or this. Neither the keeper's kits nor those of the outfield players had much of a connection to the traditional blue and white of Chelsea or Bochum, or red and white of Nottingham Forest or Bayern Munich. In some cases, old color schemes were used in a radically different way. Hardly anyone thinks of Barcelona when you see this kit. From Asia to Europe to North and South America. This decade will be remembered as an important period in the design of kits. In contrast to the new millennium, designs have become more simple again, while branding has gotten more and more visible. And thus, welcome to the 21st century, the age of consumerism and self-expression. Integrity, respect and the sense of belonging together have been replaced by status symbols. This Paris Saint-Germain jersey from 2018 was available for 2,400 euro. 
couleurs que vous voyez là, rebrodées et euh, retravaillées avec des cristaux Swarovski. Ça a été euh, très inspirant. Jerseys are now prestige products. Even people who have little to do with football decorate themselves in club colors. Although they only change a little each season, people keep buying them. A new generation of designers on Instagram like XZTals or ZPace prove that supporters wouldn't mind some more wild designs. In 2017, Italian student and football fan Nello Carutenuto helped to design Manchester United's third kit. Even Paul Pogba was blown away. Ma fatto una grande cosa qua. Grazie. Eh, mamma mia. Oh. <laughs> football jerseys are more popular than ever. It seems people keep updating their sense of belonging to their club. In 2018, Bayern Munich sold 2.5 million jerseys. Only Real Madrid and Manchester United sold more. And Barcelona? They sell most of their jerseys with this guy's name on them. The guy who has scored over 600 goals in more than 40 different Barca jerseys. Most of them came in the iconic red and blue home kit, which young football generations might identify not as the Barca shirt, but as the Messi shirt. But it's not the most valuable jersey of all time. Nope, it's this one. Pelé's 1970 World Cup final shirt was auctioned off for a respectable sum of 260,000 euros. A jersey from an age when kits were not much more than a garment showing whose side you are on.